Amen. Nothing like the sound of kids in church. It's a beautiful sound. I've heard people say before they don't like the sound of babies in church or kids in church, and you don't understand what church is about if, uh, if you feel that way, just uh, truthfully stated. Well, this morning, uh, we are beginning a new series in God's Word, and it's one that I'm excited about uh, because I love the letters of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul expressed the gospel in some of the most beautiful terms of any of the authors of Scripture. And this morning, we begin a study in his two letters to the Christians in Thessalonica some 1900 years ago. And so we begin this morning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And we come to a place where we see Paul begins his letters as he often does with this thankfulness for what God has done among his people. And I think that Many times it's easy for us as Christians in a day in which our culture is seriously on a decline that we can become pessimistic. I think it's easy for us to view the future in a, in a glass half empty type perspective, that there's really not much hope, that things are going to keep getting worse. And maybe that's true in this culture, but it does not have to be true in this church. Amen? Amen. Just because the world is falling apart doesn't mean the church will fall apart. And that's what really matters. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what should give us hope and strength and peace at the end of the day. And I look at the New Testament and I see statements where Jesus says things like, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I, I see the, the firm statement of Jesus where he speaks about the future of his bride, the church, and how the gospel will spread throughout the world. And he assures us the harvest is plentiful. There are plenty of people that I am going to bring into my kingdom and make a part of my church. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. You see, we, we forget that while God calls us into the harvest field and while we have a responsibility to proclaim this gospel to the ends of the earth, we, we forget the promise of success in the preaching and the sharing and the teaching of the gospel. God has himself declared, promised, and ordained from all eternity past that his church will prevail throughout time and history. And so the title of the sermon this morning is Beyond Our Wildest Expectations because that is the future of God's church. It is beyond our wildest expectations. We have no idea how good things are going to be for God's people moving forward toward eternity. Now, did I say our life is going to be easy? No, we may suffer. We may be persecuted. But brothers and sisters, it's going to be good because we have Christ. We have his church. We have one another. We have his gospel. We have the truth. We have eternal life that can never be taken from us. We have everything we need and so much more. We have blessings far beyond what we even could possibly comprehend. And the future of this church, if we remain faithful to Christ, and I'm confident by God's grace we will, and the future of Christ's bride throughout the earth is bright. It is beyond our wildest expectations. You have no idea what God has in store for this church and for churches like it scattered across this planet. And so Paul writes to the Christians in Thessalonica encouraging them because they were living in difficult times as well. And the, 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 the future of the church would have been easy to view as dim, as hopeless, as 
as if they were going to see just constant decline and fewer and fewer people come to faith in Christ. And Paul writes, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly, remembering you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that there need so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception that we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. That's our future, brothers and sisters. The future is bright. It is beyond our wildest expectations. And I'm here to tell you today that, yes, our country is in a horrible place. And it looks like things won't get better in this land for a long time unless God intervenes in ways that we simply cannot foresee. But the future of our church is bright. I pastored, by the way, I, I turned 30 today, and I have people tell me I had someone just this week at our associational meeting. It wasn't one of you. It was someone from another church here in Grant Parish. God have mercy on their soul. And they said to me, <laughs> they said to me, oh, hey, uh, what do you do here, you know? Uh, and I said, well, I'm, I'm the pastor at here at First Baptist Paulet. We were having our meeting at the church, but it was, you know, like 33 churches meeting here Monday. And I said, oh, I'm a pastor here at, at Pollock. And she said to me, she said, but you look like a baby. You couldn't be the pastor. And she said, uh, how long have you been a pastor? And I said, 11 years. And she went, Pfft. Like, come on. And I'm, I'm not kidding. I said, I, I, I became a pastor on my 19th birthday. I was called as pastor on my birthday. And I've been pastoring ever since. And I turned 30 Sunday. It's been 11 years. And um, anyways, finally, I convinced her that I wasn't lying to her. Um, but, you know, I, I say all that to, to point out that God is in control of our lives. He's in control of this church. The, the future is bright. And let me tell you something. I mean, I had no intention whatsoever of becoming a pastor. I mean, I, I wanted, as a, as a young kid and teenager, I wanted the job that paid the most. I mean, I wanted to do something I liked. I was thinking like engineering or something, you know. But nonetheless, I, I, I wanted to make a lot of money and all that and... And I became a preacher. And obviously I didn't do it for the money. But 
the, the thing about that is, is that I became a preacher because God just called me. It wasn't anybody's idea. It wasn't anything I'd ever thought of. God literally called me. And I don't want to share my whole testimony right now about how God called me to preach. Uh, you've, many of you have heard me share that before. But God just intervened in my life in a way that it was never a thought in my mind or anyone else's mind that I would be a preacher. And believe me, if you had known me when I was a young teenager, you would be just as shocked. I mean, um, we have, um, we have uh, Miss Deborah Coe. She, she grew up in this church and uh, Jane and Ensley's daughters. And she was my principal in junior high. And she couldn't believe when I was called as pastor of this church. Who is going to be the pastor? I suspended that kid when he was, you know, going, him? You got to be kidding. And I told her, I said, yeah, Miss Coe, you know, the Lord, he works miracles. And she said, you're right, he does. Because you're the last person I ever thought would pastor my home church. Uh, but, of course, she loves me and is very gracious and kind to me. And she's going to be upset when she finds out I talked about her from the pulpit this morning. But I love her. And it's a testimony to how God really does direct our lives. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, my father wasn't a pastor. My grandfather wasn't a pastor. I found out that my great, great, great grandfather was a missionary and planted some of the first Baptist churches in the state of Louisiana. I had no idea about that until recently. I discovered that fact. But believe me, when I was growing up, I, I had no plans, but God directed my life. And God has you here today. And he has you here in this church because he's behind the wheel. He's the one driving. He's the one in control. And that's so good. And, and we look in God's word this morning at the promises that God makes to his people and how he will do all that they could ever ask or desire or even more. And, and we see the, the richness of the gospel and the hope that is ours in Christ. And so this morning, I want to show you how Paul just is so grateful to the Lord for all that he's doing in the Thessalonian church. And it's really, it could be my own words about this church here at Pollock, how grateful I am to the Lord for what he's done. I spent three years pastoring at the church before this, a church in Texas. I spent three years at the church before this and three years or two years before that and three years in my home church in Louisiana. And at the last church where I was for the three years, I didn't baptize a single person in that three years. Not once did I ever get to fill up the baptistry in that church. You think I didn't want to? It, it wasn't because I didn't want to. You think I wasn't sharing the gospel? You think I didn't lead people to Christ? I led a lot of people to Christ. In fact, I, that's when I became most greatly involved, most heavily involved in pro-life ministry. And I, I led people to Christ outside of abortion clinics. And I would, but they were, you know, an hour away in Waco. And I knew pastors in Waco and I'd lead people to Christ who lived in the area. Or I'd find out where they lived and I'd connect them with a good church and a pastor. And they would be baptized in that church and join that church. I, uh, I counseled couples for marriage that other pastors were able to marry because they didn't live where I lived. I lived way out in the sticks in the middle of the woods. And it was a tiny little church that I pastored. I mean, I led a lot of people to faith in Christ. I, I, I counseled a lot of couples for marriage, but during that three years, I didn't get to marry anybody. I didn't get to baptize anybody. I did have a few baby dedications, some of my own children and others. Uh, you know, four kids, you get to preach baby dedications pretty often. And, and um, I got to see God grow the kingdom. And it was a humbling experience because, I mean, I would call pastors up, and this was a pretty regular thing in pro-life ministry as I was leading people to the Lord. Hey, I just led someone to the Lord. They live down the street from your church. Uh, they, want to, they want to be a part of your church. They're going to be there on Sunday. And they need to find a local church and join. And by the way, they're going to be marrying the, the young mother of the child. And they want to get married in your church and all that. And I mean, you know, that, that was a regular thing that I was doing. And it was humbling because my church wasn't growing. 
I was watching other pastors' churches grow, but God taught me to rejoice in what he was doing in those people's lives and in the church, church's life that he was using me to be a part of. Three years without baptizing anyone, that's hard on a pastor. But God taught me so much through it. And now I come to this passage, and Paul in the first three verses, he begins by having a statement of his thankfulness for God's people. Just, just how gracious he is for that church. And this is also a statement for how I as a pastor am so grateful for First Baptist Pollock. I thank God constantly in my prayers for this church. And so I understand how Paul, who planted the church in Thessalonica, I understand how he was so thankful for the church that was there to this day many years after he had gone on to plant other churches and pastor in other places. And so he writes to them and says, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy. Silvanus is Silas in the book of Acts. Silvanus is just another way of of, it's another form of the name Silas. So Paul and Silvanus or Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ grace to you and peace. There's something I want you to notice about verse 1 is he writes to the church of the Thessalonians. You know we often talk about the word church in the wrong way. And I grew up doing this. It's, it's a hard habit to break. I don't know if I ever will. But, you know, we say things like, uh, I'll meet you at the church. And when we're talking about that, we mean the building, right? Well, the church is not the building. We also say, did you go to church today? And what you mean is, is did you go to the place where people met to worship God? Or, or did you go to worship service? But the church is not the building, and the church is not the worship service. The church is the people. The people who meet together on the Lord's Day every week in any part of this world to worship the Lord together. The church is the people. It's not the place. It's not the, what we do together. It's who we are. The word ekklesia in the Greek language, it, it, it it comes from a, a Greek word, kaleo, to be called. And we're the ones who have been called by God out of this world. The, the, the beginning of the word ekklesia, out of, ek, something that comes out of. We have been called out of this world to belong to Jesus Christ and to serve him. The word was used to speak of those who gathered together. And so the Greek word had this idea of being called out of the world, but it was also used as it came from the Hebrew Old Testament when they translated it into Greek. The, the word in Hebrew, kahal, the assembly of God's people that wandered through the wilderness, the, 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 the people who belonged to the Lord, God's congregation or assembly. That word when the Old Testament in Hebrew, when it was translated into Greek, in what was called the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which was the Bible of Jesus' day, the word that was used for the, the group of people who wandered in the wilderness and the group of people who would meet at the temple and I love to go into the congregation of the righteous, that Hebrew word kahal, assembly or congregation, was translated to the word ekklesia in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So when Jesus uses the word ekklesia to speak of the church, not only does he mean you've been called out of this world and you belong to him, but also it means that you are are the congregation of God's people and you are connected to those people way back there thousands of years ago throughout the Old Testament beginning with Adam and Eve. You, you, you are connected throughout thousands of years with God's people throughout time and history. You are the church. And we speak of the universal church as it is spoken of in Scripture, but most often as it is here, it speaks of those who gather together at least every Lord's Day, every Sunday, to worship God together. And they are the ones who are called out, the assembly, the congregation of God's people, the ones who meet together, that's what it means, the ones who gather together, the church. 
By the way, I just want to throw this out there because I, I spoke to someone just yesterday who told me, I'm, I'm a Christian, but I don't like to go to church. And I just told him, I said, well, according to the Bible, if you're a Christian, you are part of the church, and the word church means those who gather together. So if you don't gather together with the church, according to the Bible, you're probably not a part of the church. The Bible knows nothing of a Christian who does not belong to a church and meet together with a local church. That idea is totally foreign to the New Testament. Why doesn't the New Testament talk about it? Because it was unthinkable. It, it, it was just considered impossible. I mean, if you're a part of God's people, if you're a Christian, you belong to a church. It was assumed. That there was, no, there was no, no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian who didn't belong to a church. Listen, if you don't belong to a church, there's a problem. And if you continue in that for very long, there's a good reason to question whether or not you have truly come to know the Lord because there is serious disobedience in your life if you do not want to be a part of a local church. That's a real problem, biblically speaking. That's not just a pastor speaking. That's God's word. That's what it teaches from beginning to end. And so Paul writes to the church to the people who have been called out of this world, who gather together every Lord's Day to worship God together in the city of Thessalonica in that day and time. He writes to the church of the Thessalonians who are in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he mentions the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity later, but he says that we are the church in the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So notice that Christ here is equal to the Father as well as the Holy Spirit, who is mentioned later. But notice how Christ is mentioned right alongside God the Father. And he is the Lord Jesus Christ. This word Lord, kurios in Greek, comes from the Hebrew Yahweh, or as the King James stated it, Jehovah. In the Hebrew was said Yahweh. And it is speaking of the Lord, God, Yahweh, Jehovah, Jesus is the Lord, Yahweh, Jesus, that's his name, Christ, that's his title. Christ means Messiah, King. The word Christ means King, the anointed one, the King of God's people. We have been called out of this world by the Father to belong to Jesus, who is Yahweh, Jehovah, our God, our Savior, that's what the word Jesus means, Savior, and He is our King. The Lord Jesus Christ literally means the one who is our God, our Savior, and our King. And that's who we belong to, church. He says in verse 2, We give thanks to God always for all of you constantly, or y'all as we would say, we give thanks for y'all always constantly mentioning you in our prayers. We pray for you all the time, Paul says. Why? Because we love you and we're constantly thinking about you and how is the church doing back in Thessalonica? I wonder how they're doing. I want to pray for them. I love them. You know someone cares about you if they check on you and call you and you know they, they you, you Something happens in your life and, and they want to be there for you and they're praying for you. Listen, you may have people in your life who are always calling you and checking on you, mom, dad, your brother, your sister, whoever it is, and you might say, God, after a while I get worn out on it. But listen, they do it because they love you. And Paul's saying, we are always praying for you because, man, you just mean so much to us. We love you so much. We care so much about you. And we're thanking God for you. Why thank God for them? Because God made that church. That church would not exist if God had not called them out of this world. God gets the credit for the church existing. And so Paul thanks God for the church and all the fruit that the church bears. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to say something here. Anytime anything good happens in the church, you and I do not get the credit. God does. Those three years I spent as a pastor ministering the gospel, I was faithful. I was serving the Lord, and there was fruit. I just didn't experience it much in my church where I pastored. But there was fruit. And it was not due to a lack of faithfulness. It was not due to a lack of hard work. It was just God's timing. 
and what he was doing. And I just had to trust him throughout those three years. And then I come here, and lately in this church, it's been like new people are walking through the door and joining the church every Sunday and getting baptized. And, 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 and it's just amazing what God is doing. And guess what? I'm doing the same thing that I did during those three years when I didn't baptize a single person. Do you understand? God is in control, not the preacher. So don't give me credit, because if I had been your pastor during those three years, if you judged by outward signs of success as the world judges success, you would have thought I was a failure of a pastor. But I promise you, I was the same pastor preaching the same message, doing the same things then as I am now. Nothing's changed. It's just God in his time decided, here you go, here's a bucket of blessings. I'm going to pour them out on you. I didn't do that, he did. And it might stop for a year and then start back up. And look, you don't control the movement of the Holy Spirit. You, you cannot rein him in on a leash and say, you know, Holy Spirit, we need a couple people to get saved. Could you call a couple people, you know, because we, we ain't baptized and the annual report's coming up and we need some more baptisms because the church down the street, they got more baptisms than us, you know. And, you know, Lord, uh, we need you to help us out here. Listen, you don't control the Holy Spirit. You can't pressure people into getting saved. You can't pressure people into joining the church, at least not for the right reasons. You can't make it happen. God makes it happen. So what do you and I do? We proclaim the word. We are the church. We do what the church does. And we leave the fruit and the results up to the Lord. And he says the harvest is plentiful. I promise you there will be a harvest. Just do the labor. The harvest will come. And you might go for years and not see a harvest. But let me tell you, it will come. It's just there's a harvest season. There's a time, a season for sowing. And you don't get to eat much during that time if you don't have it stored up. You know, you're sowing and you can't eat your crop while it's growing in the ground and coming out of the ground. But then there's a time of reaping. And there's just a time when all of a sudden it's just like there's, there, it, you don't even know where it's coming from. God's just making it happen. And then you go back to a time of sowing and a time of reaping. And that's how God does things. So don't give me credit for anything good that happens in this church. I promise you, I didn't do it. God did. He says, verse 3, Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's such a beautiful verse here in verse 3. The way it is written in the Greek language, the idea here is, is that we give thanks to God as we remember before God how you have had this work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope. And the idea as it is written in the original Greek is you have this work that you are constantly doing and that work is a result of your faith. The source of your good works is your faith. And the same thing with labor of love. You, you keep working for Christ. You, you, keep, you keep serving. You keep teaching Sunday school. You keep sharing the gospel. You continue on in these ministries. You keep showing up to minister to families when they pass away. And we need to provide a meal for them. And, and you just keep doing what God has called you to do. You keep laboring faithfully because of the love that you have for God and his people. The source of your labor is your love. You don't love because you labor. You labor because you love. You don't do good works. I mean, you don't have faith because you do good works. You do good works because you have faith. And then the same with the third one. Your steadfastness, your, your endurance, the fact that you don't lose hope, the fact that you, you, you don't feel defeated and you don't give up. Your steadfastness of hope. Why are you steadfast? Why do you keep on going even in the hard times because of the hope you have in Christ? Because you have eternal life and it can never be taken from you. Peter says it is an eternal life that can never perish, spoil, or fade. The hope you have in Christ is secure and it will not be assailed because it is held by the hand of Almighty God. So you work because you have faith. You labor because you love. You endure. You are steadfast because of the hope you have. You don't do good works because you're a good person. 
You do good works because of the faith you have, and God has changed your heart, and you are a new creature in Christ. You don't work so hard because you want a pat on the back, not if you're doing it rightly. You don't want credit. You don't want glory. You just love God and his people, and you just want to serve. That's why you do it. You don't keep on going because you're so tough, because you're so determined. You keep on going because you're looking at the prize. You're looking at what God has laid up for you. You're looking at the hope of heaven, and you're saying, man, when I cross that finish line, it's going to be worth it. That's why you do it. And God, God is doing all these things in the Thessalonian church and in our church here today. And Paul is just thanking God, saying, Lord, Thank you for doing what we cannot do ourselves. And secondly, in verses 4 through 5, we see the proof of God's grace. He says in verse 4, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Paul says here, we know, and he says, before he gets on to what he wants to say, he just says, by the way, you are loved by God. Just don't forget that. Just, Paul just throws it in there. By the way, God loves you. And when he says he loves you, he doesn't mean that in a flippant way. He means, seriously, God puts you before himself. That's what the word love means. I mean, God, God has given up things for you. Jesus died on a cross for you. He, he paid the price of your sin on Calvary. God loves you. He says, brothers who are loved by God, we know that God has chosen you. The way that it's said here in the Greek language is, he says, we know that you are the elect. That's what it literally says in the Greek language. We know that you are the chosen. That's an amazing thing. Paul's saying, we know you are God's chosen people. What is he talking about? Well, Paul says in a number of his letters that before time and eternity, before God created the heavens and the earth, before he said, let there be light, he chose that Jesus would receive all glory. He chose that his son, Jesus, would be the king of creation. And then he chose a people to give to Jesus, his son, as his bride. And he chose that these people belong to my son Jesus. And he said, here Jesus, they're yours. And then he said, in Holy Spirit, you are going to call them to faith. You are going to move in their heart. You're going to transform them. You're going to, you're going to change them from the inside out. And you're going to sanctify them to be a people for Jesus' possession. They will belong to him and you will just get them ready for him. And so in eternity past, God decided to do that. And he knew who those people who would be a part of Christ's bride would be. He knew their names. He knew when they would live. He knew how many hairs would be on their head. And then he said, let there be a heavens and an earth. Let there be light. Then he created everything. But before creation, he decided to do this. And here's what Paul says. I know that you're a part of that chosen people that the Father gave to the Son in eternity past. I know that you're a part of them because our word did not come to you, our gospel did not come to you merely in word, but it also came in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. People often ask as we look at doctrines in the Bible like election and predestination, which are, are difficult doctrines to accept, but which just they're in the Bible. They're there. We can't ignore them. We can't pretend like it's not true. It's, it's there. God put it there. We don't get to decide what parts of the Bible we will and will not believe. It's there. And people will ask the question, well, how, how do I know if I'm part of the elect? How do I know who the elect are? Here's your answer. If you're a believer, that's how you know. Paul says, our, word, our, our gospel did not come to you merely in word. Because what usually happens when you share your faith? It comes merely in word. They hear it and they said, I don't want nothing to do with that. And they walk away. 
I don't want to hear about that. I don't want to hear about your Jesus. I don't want to hear about your church. I don't want anything to do with that. And then you share the gospel with someone and they said, man, that's what I need. And you're saying, man, I must be a pretty good evangelist because, I mean, that, that dude right there, his life's been messed up. And then suddenly we're baptizing him and he's in the church and, and he's serving and he's doing, and his life turned around. And then you realize, oh, God planned to do that all along. I didn't do it. He did. That's, that's what Paul's saying. Who are the elect? God knows. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit, they know. Nobody else. Maybe they've told the angels about it. I don't know. But we don't know, okay? They know. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Our job, preach the message. Share it with all people indiscriminately. Preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. But just know that God has people who are marked out who will believe. So when you go and preach, know people will be saved because God decided to save them before he ever created this universe. And that should not leave you sitting back saying, well, there's an elect people and God's going to save them so I don't have to do anything. If that's the way you're thinking, you don't understand what the Bible's about. Rather... You should read this and say, God has a chosen people. I want to go see him come to faith. I'm going to go preach and God's going to save. And I'm excited now because the success of my mission is already guaranteed. Church, God will bring more people in. You know how I know? Because God says that before he ever created the heavens and the earth, he marked out people that he would save and they're living in our community right now waiting for us to share the gospel with them. Do you understand how wonderful of a truth that is? That's not something to get upset about. That's something to say, thank you, Lord. Now I can go out and share this message and actually have some confidence that it'll make a difference. Because it doesn't depend on me. It depends on God who already said, you share the message, I'll save the people. I've already decided to do it. Now go do the work. That's the whole point. He says, we know that you are the called, uh, the chosen. We know that you are the chosen because our gospel did not come to you merely in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Now, you heard that message and you grabbed onto it. And that's how we know they belong to God. Because look at what God did in their life. That's how you know they're his. Because God works in their heart when they hear that gospel that you are supposed to go and share with them. He says, you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And as a pastor... Man, that, doesn't, that speaks to me so clearly. Listen, I've heard it said, St. Francis of Assisi, this quote is shared so often, and I just, I hate it. It said, um, preach the gospel often and when necessary, use words. Okay, the word preach means to proclaim. It, it talks about, you know, speaking a message. So you can't proclaim a message if you're not speaking. That's not possible. Okay, first, first point. That's a contradiction. Secondly, it's not either you preach the message or you live according to the message. It's both. And if you don't do both, you're not useful to God. You understand that? You can be the best preacher in the world, but if your life does not live out the message that you share with others, you will not be useful to God. And if you live out the gospel, but you never bother to tell others about it, you will not be useful to God. You must share the message and live according to it. You must do both or you are useless to God when it comes to him building his kingdom through his people. Do you understand? And so you must live according to the gospel that you share with others. But you also must go and tell them that gospel. And they'll know that you really believe it because they see you live according to what you're telling them. You practice what you preach. And so they might actually believe you if you practice what you preach. Because they know that you're not just saying it. You really mean it. You really believe what you're telling them. You really think a guy was crucified 2,000 years ago buried in a tomb, and three days later came out of the tomb, and not only that, he's God. You really believe that message. Your life shows it. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for you and your sake. 
And then lastly, verses 6 to 10. Paul just goes through and lists the abundance of fruit, all the things God was doing in the church. And man, I could just sit here and tell you about all the things that God has been doing here at First Baptist Pollock. Man, just all the amazing, and I just, every week I'm like, man, God, you really, you exceeded my expectations. I'm going to be honest, God. I didn't see that coming. Thank you. He says in verse 6, And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. You received the word in much affliction. What's that word affliction? The word flipsis in Greek, what does it mean? It means persecution. It literally means stress, pressure, or anxiety that is put on a person when they are suffering because they became a Christian. These people are losing jobs. They're losing their home. They're being threatened with physical violence because they became a Christian. And Paul says even those people began to persecute you because you became a Christian. You didn't run away from Christ. You ran towards Toward Christ, and you imitated us and the Lord Jesus Christ, who in the middle of persecution, what did they do? They preached more loudly. I love the story in Acts 14 of Paul. He goes into Lystra and he preaches the gospel, and they stone him to death and they drag him out of the city. And Paul wakes up. He was unconscious. They thought he was dead. He wakes up. And you know what Paul does? He goes back into the city and finishes the sermon. That's the kind of preacher I want to be. The one who just keeps going no matter what. And they didn't dare stone him again. They were like, we're not messing with that dude. He is, God has his hand on him. We're going to leave him alone. He says, you became imitators of us in the Lord. You received the word in much affliction. And even though you were being persecuted, you had the joy of the Holy Spirit. You weren't depressed. You were joyful. He says, verse 7, So you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. That's the whole region that they lived in. Throughout that whole part of the world, people knew about how the Christians in Thessalonica were following Christ. And they were an example to everyone else. He says, verse 8, For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, they just keep sharing the gospel. Man, they just keep sending out missionaries. They keep telling people about Jesus. And God keeps saving people the more they share the, the gospel. He says, not only has the word sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere to the ends of the earth, just like it's supposed to, so that we need not say anything. Oh, I love to hear that too as a preacher. You know what Paul's saying? You know, I used to be your pastor. But I don't need to do missions for you guys because you're doing it yourselves. Listen, the job of a pastor, it says in Ephesians 4, is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And here's what Paul's saying. He's saying, you know, I share the gospel all the time. I've seen a lot of people come to faith in Christ as I've gone out and told them. But let me tell you something. You guys, this church, you are winning far more people to Christ than I ever could on my own. This was a church that understood that it was not the preacher's job to, to share the, the, the gospel alone. But the preacher is just supposed to be one of the people who is going out into this world daily sharing Christ with people. And, and I pray that you would really let that sink in, that you are an evangelist too. At least you're called to be one. Every Christian is called to share this gospel. And it's not just my job, it's all of our job together. And Paul says, I don't need to do it for you because you are doing such a good job. Does that mean Paul wasn't preaching Christ? Of course he was. We know he did. But what he's saying is, is that they were doing it too. This is not the kind of church where they expect the preacher to do everything and we'll show up and be, be pew sitters and bystanders. You're not in the bleachers. You're not sitting in the stadium. You're on the field. You're in the game. You're supposed to be laboring alongside. And that's what Paul's saying. They got that. They understood that. And they did the work of the ministry along with their pastors. And so Paul says... It is sounded forth from you, and we don't even need to say anything. You're doing such a good job. He says, verse 9, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception that we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. These people used to worship statues and images. And they left idolatry and pagan false religion to follow Jesus Christ. 
And so you think this person in your life, there's no hope for them. There's no way they could ever come to faith in Christ. You don't understand how God works. You don't understand the power of the Holy Spirit. He can convert the Apostle Paul, who used to persecute Christians. He can handle, you know, your uncle or whoever it is who doesn't know the Lord. Believe me, he can do it. All right? You turn from idols to serve the living and the true God. And now you are, you are saved to serve him and to wait for his son from heaven. Your hope's not in this earth. You're waiting on the day Jesus comes back. To wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. And don't just read over that, ladies and gentlemen, because you know that three days after he was crucified, Jesus rose from the dead. Paul's saying, if God could raise his own son from the dead, just imagine what he's going to do in the church. You say, well, this is a dead community. No one can come to faith. Good news. God raises dead people. That's the good news. They're spiritually dead. Guess what? God will resurrect them. That's what salvation is. You were dead in your sins and trespasses, but God made you alive through faith in Jesus Christ. By grace you were saved. And not of your own works, not of your own doing, so that no one can boast. You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared beforehand in eternity past that we should walk in them. That's the gospel. And we are guaranteed success. The only question is, are you going to be a part of it? Or are you going to sit and watch everybody else do it? Because it's going to happen. God's going to build his kingdom. The only question is, do you want to be a part of it? He raised his own son from the dead, and he is Jesus, the one who delivers us from the wrath to come. What is this word, wrath? What does it mean? It's God's anger against sin and the sinner. The wrath to come is the punishment for sin. The word wrath means mad, angry, and God is angry with sinners. Don't let anyone tell you that's not true. The Bible says otherwise. Here's the good news, though. Jesus saves you from the wrath of God against sinners for their sin because he paid for your sin upon the cross and he rose from the grave. Not only did he pay for your sin, but he secured your eternal life through his resurrection from the dead. And Jesus saves you from the wrath of God the Father, which is to come for those who will spend eternity in a real place called hell. He has saved you from this. Now go and serve him. And so I just leave you, church, with this. The future of God's kingdom, the future of Jesus' bride, and the future of this local church here in Pollock is beyond our wildest expectations. So be a part of it. I pray that you would work in some ministry in this church and know that God will bring fruit through it. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Your labor in the Lord is never in vain. Please remember that. Anything you do for the Lord is never done in vain. You say, well, I didn't see anything come from it. That doesn't mean there wasn't fruit. God just didn't let you see it because he knew you'd be too proud if you saw it. He just wanted to keep you humble. Somebody was saved through that. You didn't even know about it. They heard you sharing Christ and the person you were sharing it with didn't listen. But the person behind you that you didn't even see was listening and they went back to their pastor and they gave their life to Christ. And you're not going to find out about it until you get to heaven because God says your labor in the Lord is never in vain. And you thought you were wasting your time, but you weren't. So are you going to be a part of this or not? Because God's kingdom's moving forward with or without you. Have you come to Christ or have you not? Have you been saved from the wrath to come? If not, you better run to Christ because he will save you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and for each one here. Thank you for this gospel by which we are saved and the hope we have and the certainty of salvation and of a future and of a hope for your people. Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts and lives. There are people here today who need to come to Christ for salvation. Lord, would you call them? And would they come? Lord, there are people here today who need to join this local church. Would you call them, Lord? And would they come? Lord, there are people here today who've been waiting to be baptized. 
would you call them? And would they come? Lord, only you can do these things. As a pastor, I can't make it happen. I can't manipulate people. And if I did, the fruit would be false and it would soon be revealed to be just a sham. But Lord, if you do it, it'll last. And it'll be beyond our wildest expectations. So God, would you do your work and your people? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.